Jan Russ was the casting agent for Neighbors, an Australian soap opera. In 2008, Russ started to receive phone calls. Every day for weeks, a teenage girl would call Russ's office and ask to speak with her. As luck would have it, Russ happened to be casting for the part of a 17-year-old. She reluctantly agreed to meet the teenage caller. Shortly after, Margot Robbie made her first appearance on Neighbors, setting her on the path to Hollywood stardom. After a few years, Robbie abandoned her character, Donna, asking the producers to kill her off. Robbie was moving to America in hopes of becoming a movie star. She was told that her character would survive and it would be explained that Donna was leaving Australia to attend school. Robbie elaborated on a recent episode of Hot Ones. Because they said, well, you know, if things don't work out in America, we want you to be able to come back and play the role again. So my character also moved to America. Incidentally, I guess she's still there because I haven't been back on the show. Robbie was determined not to come back. In this video, we'll be taking you through Margot Robbie's career in Hollywood and what drives her astronomical ambitions. Because just like many of her characters, Robbie is tough, hardworking, and driven to define herself on her own terms. And that journey kicked off with her breakout role in a movie called The Wolf of Wall Street. Soon after landing a role in the short-lived drama Pan Am, Robbie was made aware that Martin Scorsese was auditioning actresses for a part in a new film. The part was described in the movie's screenplay as the hottest blonde ever. With all of New York auditioning, Robbie figured she didn't have a chance. She sent in a tape anyway. Scorsese's longtime casting director, Ellen Lewis, who cast many of Scorsese's iconic female characters, saw something in Robbie's tape. Scorsese called her into test with Leonardo DiCaprio. As she stepped into the audition, Robbie was petrified. At 22, she was only a few years removed from the teenager she had played on Neighbors, and here she was auditioning for the part of a lifetime with Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio. As Robbie recounts it, DiCaprio started improvising, confusing her. She said that she looked at him weird. Leo's like, what's that look for? And then I realized he's ad-libbing, she said in an interview. DiCaprio was yelling, intimidating Robbie. Robbie started screaming, struggling to keep up. DiCaprio went back to the script. Now get over here and kiss me, he said. He pulled Robbie over. In the script, Robbie's character was supposed to do just that, kiss him. But Robbie was in a frenzy. You have 30 seconds left in this room, and if you don't do something impressive, then nothing will ever come of it, she thought. Instead of kissing him, Robbie slapped him across the face for real, and swore at him. The room fell silent. Robbie worried that she'd be charged with assault, but Scorsese and DiCaprio started laughing. Soon after, she had the role. The role was Naomi, the embattled wife of DiCaprio's Jordan Belfort. When Robbie read the script, she was quickly able to get a read on the character. Unlike Robbie, Naomi was a manipulator, able to seduce the powerful men around her into giving her what she wanted. But she had something in common with Robbie. Naomi was a hustler. Robbie was raised in rural Queensland, Australia. In interviews, she still seems hesitant to discuss the details, not wanting to play into Australian stereotypes. But she had a true outback upbringing, with snakes and other wildlife occasionally invading her home. Quoted in a Vanity Fair profile, she said, People always want to know, did you have kangaroos outside your bedroom window? I'm like, yes, but none of my other friends did. Robbie was estranged from her father and raised by her single mother, Sari, who worked as a physiotherapist. Sari supported Robbie and her three siblings, and when Margot was a teen, she began working three jobs in order to contribute. Robbie cleaned houses, worked at a surf shop, and put in hours at Subway as a sandwich artist. Robbie was a perfectionist from the very beginning. Because I you know, would really spread everything out to the edges, the right amount of everything. Took it seriously. Yeah, and now when I go to Subway and someone just kind of like throws it on right in the middle, like I just, it kills me. Like I actually don't go that often anymore because I watch them make it badly and I'm, I'm upset. After appearing in a few low budget films, Robbie moved to big city Melbourne in an attempt to kickstart her acting career. After weeks of couch surfing, she finally pestered Jan Russ into a neighbor's audition. Even behind the scenes of the show, Robbie's competitiveness was on full display. A male crew member joked that he could eat more spaghetti than she could, and Robbie challenged him to an eating contest. Robbie won. And at the end of it, I had eaten 1.8 kilos of spaghetti bolognese, which is equivalent to four pounds. <laughs> no way. When she was called back to set, Robbie was unable to move. A nurse had to induce vomiting. Later that day, Robbie was shooting again. Against her Australian agent's wishes, 
Robbie recounted this gross Bolognese story to an American agent. The agent decided to represent her. I like to think that they saw Robbie's drive in that story. They saw someone who wouldn't take no for an answer. And if they did, they were right. During her prep for Wolf of Wall Street, Robbie wanted to master Naomi's Brooklyn accent. She studied the differences between accents in different neighborhoods within Brooklyn and tried to piece together how the accent would change with her character's psychology. Stop flexing your muscles, Jordan. You look like a fucking imbecile. Quoted in an interview at the time, she said, I also wanted to have made a conscious effort to pull down the Brooklyn from the accent. I wanted her to be aware of the fact that she was hanging out with people with a lot of money, and she would be a little embarrassed of her original humble beginnings. In an interview around the release of the movie, Robbie beams about how impressed Brooklyn natives are with her accent work. She also said this, which I thought was pretty funny. My mom's from Brooklyn, and I can't do her accent, her original accent. She's really? a bit more English which part now. Of Brooklyn? Um, you know what, I'm not even entirely sure. It's a big place, isn't You're it? You're a bad son. Do you have a... Oh, thanks. <laughs> Robbie is obviously joking, but it does speak to the amount of research she did for the film. Whatever neighborhood the interviewer would have answered, I'm sure Robbie would have had something to say about it. Another challenge of the film were the many nude scenes, particularly a now infamous scene between Robbie and DiCaprio in a baby's nursery. The scene, which has graphic nudity and depicts acts where the consent is ambiguous, took 17 hours to shoot. During those 17 hours, Robbie was surrounded by an entirely male crew. Robbie notes this in interviews close to the film's release, but since she is still essentially promoting the movie, she can't really say anything too negative about it. From a purely outsider, speculative perspective, I would guess that the experience rattled Robbie a little and may have motivated some of her decisions later on. Unfortunately, this would not be Robbie's last encounter with a difficult work environment, because a few years after Wolf, Margot Robbie made Suicide Squad. Suicide Squad was written and directed by David Ayer, a guy who kicked off his career with the screenplay for Training Day. Training Day is an uber-masculine cop thriller about violent men committing violent acts. It was a critical and commercial success, and Ayer followed it up with a dozen other movies about violent men committing violent acts. I know very little about Ayer personally, but publicly, I feel that he's always gone out of his way to prove that he was tough. He famously shouted this at a Comic-Con panel. And he promised a DC movie that would be a gritty, serious alternative to the poppy Marvel Cinematic Universe. On set, Ayer sought to get his cast members into the headspaces of the supervillains they would be playing. During rehearsals, Ayer pitted the cast, who included Robbie as the hellion Harley Quinn, Will Smith, Jai Courtney, and more against each other, forcing them to argue and reveal dark truths about themselves. He even coaxed them into fistfights. I had them fight each other. You learn a lot about who a person really is when you punch them in the face. It gets rid of a lot of the actor stuff, Ayer said later. Robbie discussed the process in interviews. If there's ever tension, I try to diffuse the tension, and that's just a natural reaction for me. Where for Harley, it's the complete opposite. And I felt so awful, and so many times we did, like, these scenes, and I was just saying awful things. And seeing that someone's struggling with something in particular, and David's looking at me, like, you better get in there. That's your window of opportunity right there. Take it. Not everyone was as uncomfortable in the environment. Infamously, Jared Leto, while method acting as the Joker, sent obscene and threatening gifts to the other cast members, including adult toys, bullets, and to Robbie, a rat. Leto also ordered one of his henchmen to walk into a rehearsal and drop a dead pig on a table. Leto stayed in character, constantly antagonizing crew members and scaring the cast. Ayer and Leto created a sort of intensity arms race, and many of the other cast members joined in. Adewale Akineye Agbaji, who played the man-eating killer croc, listened to recordings of famous cannibals while in makeup. Under Ayer's instruction, Cara Delevingne, who played the witch enchantress, went into a forest and danced naked under the full moon. Jai Courtney, playing Captain Boomerang, who, may I add, is a comic book character who robs banks with trick boomerangs, stubbed lit cigarettes out on his own arms. On top of all of that, much of the cast, including Robbie, got squad tattoos, reaffirming their commitment to the movie. This isn't really important to this documentary, but Robbie did some of the tattoos herself and even misspelled one of them on Jai Courtney's assistant. Well, well, everyone was spelling word. it as S-K-W-A-D, yeah. but I went straight from the S to the W. Swad? Swad. <laughs> 
So not only do many famous actors have squad tattooed on them because of this movie, there is a guy walking around with SWAD permanently written on his body because he just happened to be working for Jai Courtney. Anyway, the production wasn't the only troubled thing during the making of Suicide Squad. Before shooting, Ayer was given only six weeks to work on the script, in the hopes that he could cobble the story together during production. In post-production, the movie was recut by the company who made the trailer, because the trailer had been popular, and the studio was worried the finished film was too different. The movie was also extensively reshot. Most movies spend between six and ten million dollars on reshoots. Suicide Squad spent 22. As you may already know, while Suicide Squad was a pretty big hit, it was savaged by critics and largely rejected by moviegoers. While it still undoubtedly has its fans, the movie and Leto's method antics have quickly become a pop culture punchline. So what does this have to do with Margot Robbie? Well, here I have to get a little bit speculative. Just like with Wolf of Wall Street, most of the existing interviews of Robbie talking about Suicide Squad were conducted in order to promote Suicide Squad. On top of that, the series is ongoing, and Robbie isn't really able to speak negatively about the experience. But I don't think it's much of a leap to suggest that Robbie was unhappy about the way her character was portrayed. And to talk about that, I have to talk about Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn debuted in Batman the Animated Series in 1992 because the Joker needed a new henchman. But due to her unique design and personality, Harley Quinn, as voiced by Arlene Sorkin, quickly became a fan favorite. One of the most unique elements of her character came from her relationship with the Joker. The famous and controversial comic book story Mad Love portrayed this relationship as abusive. In this disturbing origin story, Harley was a psychiatrist who fell for the Joker and pursued him despite his mistreatment. The story was adapted into an episode of the animated series, pushing the boundaries of what could be explored in a children's cartoon. Since the 90s, this dynamic has been one of the core elements of the character across all media. Harley is a survivor of abuse, and with a few recent exceptions, at the end of most of her stories, she goes back to the Joker. Suicide Squad portrays this dynamic, but doesn't really dig into it. In some scenes, Joker is scary and manipulative. In others, we're led to believe he cares for Harley. The film ends with Joker breaking Harley out of prison, a scene that is played as triumphant. This isn't the only way the movie goes out of its way to degrade Robbie and her character. It opens with her being tortured by guards, and the other members of the squad routinely threaten her with violence in a distinctly gendered way. I will knock your ass out. I do not care that you're a girl. Additionally, many critics pointed out the gross way Ayer's camera lingers on her body and the fetishistic nature of Harley's costumes. My point is not to dump on Suicide Squad, just to back up my belief that the totality of the experience, from Ayer's bizarre work environment, to the poor reception of the film, to the portrayal of Harley herself, galvanized something in Robbie. As she had always been, Robbie was ambitious, and just like Harley, she wanted control of her own destiny. Robbie had more than proven that she was a star, and from now on, she would be calling the shots. This is where Lucky Chap Entertainment comes in. When Margot Robbie was a teenager, she'd listen to music with her best friend, Sophia Kerr. They could never agree on what to listen to, but on one topic, they were united. They both wanted to work in the movies. When Robbie moved to America, Kerr became her assistant. In 2014, Robbie, Kerr, Robbie's husband Tom Ackerley, and filmmaker friend Josie McNamara, all roommates at the time, decided to form Lucky Chap Entertainment. The company has produced vehicles for Robbie and other projects centering female filmmakers. In 2016, shortly after the release of Suicide Squad, Lucky Chap signed a first look deal at Warner Brothers. This means that Robbie and her team see any relevant project before anyone else. In other words, Robbie is, more than almost any actress her age, in control of what she's able to do. Through Lucky Chap, Robbie produced I, Tanya about controversial figure skater Tanya Harding. The film was a very sympathetic view of Harding and portrays her as a victim of both the abusive men around her and the unsympathetic media. The role nabbed Robbie an Oscar nomination and was a box office success, and the hits kept on coming. Two years later, Robbie landed another massive role, one that had been a dream for a long time. When Robbie married Ackerley in 2016, guests may have been confused about the odd music she had chosen to walk down the aisle to, but any movie buffs in the audience might have recognized it. True Romance? Mm -hmm. The great Tony Scott. Really? I walked down the aisle right? to the True Romance. 
music. Come on. What? Oh, that's good. The movie chronicles the relationship between petty criminal Clarence and sex worker Alabama, who escape gangsters and the police in search of a better life. It's easy to see why Alabama, as played by Patricia Arquette, appeals to Robbie, a platinum blonde who escapes her abusive pimp and overpowers a gangster who assaults her. Alabama feels like the blueprint for some of Robbie's most iconic characters. True Romance was the first studio movie for screenwriter Quentin Tarantino. The success of the film, as well as Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs, guaranteed the director a career in Hollywood. And Hollywood, as a place and as a concept, was the focus of his next film. When Robbie first met with her American team, they asked her what her dream project would be. She said, Pie in the Sky, Tarantino. Robbie sent a letter to the director, telling him she was a big fan and that she would love to participate in any of his films. Tarantino cast her as Sharon Tate in his 1960s L.A. Odyssey, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Much has been criticized about Robbie's role in the film, not so much to do with her performance, but Tate's lack of dialogue and the way that Tarantino shoots her. But it is my humble opinion that even with those factors, Robbie's performance is deeply affecting, and the scene where Tate goes to see her own movie is one of the highlights of the film. But I would argue that Robbie's ultimate creative vision arrived three years later, in the form of Birds of Prey. After Suicide Squad, Robbie was given the keys to the kingdom in regards to her character. She reacted by reinventing her completely. Robbie decided she would develop and produce a new film. It was quickly announced that Harley Quinn would headline a girl gang movie, something Robbie thought was missing from the genre. She hired Kathy Yan, a relatively unknown director coming off an acclaimed Sundance debut. Then she hired Bumblebee screenwriter Christina Hodson to write the script. The results, even in production stills and trailers, were immediately noticeable. That's what happens when you have a female producer, director, writer, the movie's costume designer, Aaron Benack, said in an interview. Gone were Harley's Hot Topic outfits, replaced by bright, pastel-colored ensembles that could have been lifted from the closet of True Romance's Alabama. In the hands of Robbie's female-fronted crew, Quinn became a true rarity in blockbuster films, a uniquely female loser. The setup of the film is relatively simple. Harley has been dumped by the Joker, who never appears in the movie, and as a result, every criminal in Gotham is after her. Chief among them is Roman Sionis, aka the Black Mask, a gangster who wants control of both Gotham in general, and more specifically, Harley. To defeat Sionis, Quinn has to unite a disparate group of fighting women, the Birds of Prey, who put aside their differences and work together. As star and producer, Robbie's fingerprints are all over the movie. Yan may have directed the film, and Hansen may have written it, but Birds of Prey feels willed into existence by its star. The movie has so many of the themes that have hallmarked Robbie's work that it starts to feel like the emancipation of the title refers to Robbie herself. Harley is looking to define herself on her own terms, and that's the kind of superhero story that I imagine would appeal to a child of a single mother. Someone who worked three jobs to support herself and called into a soap opera every day to jumpstart her acting career. Furthermore, Harley's kinship with the Birds of Prey might connect to someone who started a production company with her childhood best friend. Someone who was able to assemble a team of women to make the action movie she always wanted to see. Harley Quinn might not have been the role that Margot Robbie dreamed of playing as a kid in the Australian Outback, but somehow it was the role she was born to play. And I think the secret to her success is that behind the glamorous movie star, the scrappy Outback kid is still visible in Robbie's performances. And from the outside at least, it looks like that kid is having fun. We had a lot of fun putting together this little documentary, and we hope you enjoyed watching it. Did we do justice to one of our favorite actors? Any Margot Robbie stories we missed? What actor or topic would you like to see us cover in the future? Let us know in the comments below.